Good morning and welcome to the fifth meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2019. Can I please ask everyone in the public gallery to switch your electronic devices to silent so they don't affect the committee's work this morning? Item 1 is decision on taking business in private. Do members agree to take items 3 and 4 in private this morning? Agreed. Thank you. Item 2 is our post-legislative scrutiny of the Control of Dogs Scotland Act 2010. This is panel one this morning. We have two panels this morning and I'd like to welcome our witnesses and to thank them for coming to the committee meeting this morning. We do really appreciate it. The purpose of this evidence session is to hear directly from people affected by dog attacks or who otherwise have knowledge about the impact of these attacks and also about the action taken by the relevant authorities, whether it's police or council, and what needs to change in our law. Now, as usual, MSPs will ask questions from witnesses, but witnesses can also ask questions of each other. We still want to retain some structure to the discussion, so I'd appreciate it if anyone would like to speak. If you could catch my eye, indicate to me, or catch Lucy's attention, and she will tell me. When you speak, your microphone will be activated automatically, so there's no need to touch the button panel in front of you. I'm going to start by asking everyone to introduce themselves. I'm Jenny Mara. I am convener of this committee and MSP for North East Scotland. Uh, good morning. I'm Liam Kerr. I'm also an MSP for North East Region, uh, and I'm deputy convener of the committee. I'm Claire Booth, and in 2015, my son, who was six years old at the time, was mauled by two English bull terriers. Alec Neil, MSP for Airdrie and Shorts, and I introduced the original dog control bill. I'm Judy Evans. I'm actually a plastic surgeon who lives in Plymouth, but I'm the honorary secretary of the Royal College of Surgeons up here, um, and I represent plastic surgery for the college, which is, of course, an international college. Anas Sarwar, and I'm an MSP for the Glasgow region. Natalie Crawford, I'm a broadcast journalist at Radio Clyde and I started the Lead the Way campaign. I'm Veronica Lynch. My daughter Kelly was killed by two Rottweiler dogs in 1989. Uh, John Lynch, I'm Kelly's father. Colin Beatty, uh, MSP for Midlothian North and Musselboro. Alistair Corfield, I'm a consultant in emergency medicine, a and &E, in Paisley, uh, and I am here representing the College of Emergency Medicine today. Hi, I'm Willie Coffey, MSP for Kilmarnock and the Irvine Valley. I'm Lisa Grady, my daughter was attacked by two Rottweilers in 2010. Uh, Bill Bowman, uh, member for the North East Region. And the other people sitting here are parliamentary staff who will assist the, the committee's meeting this morning. Would any of our witnesses who have come to give evidence this morning perhaps like to, to go first and tell us, perhaps Natalie, would you like to, to introduce you a bit about your campaign and then I'll ask our other witnesses to, to give evidence. So the Lead the Way campaign started around 18 months ago and it followed a series of freedom of information requests to our NHS health boards across Scotland, which came back and showed that thousands of people and hundreds of children every year are still going through emergency departments across Scotland with dog attack injuries. I have the figures for last year, which I believe are new to the committee. They weren't included in my written submission. So NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde last year, 1,417 people, 255 of those were children, presented at accident and emergency departments with injuries related to dog attacks. The figures for NHS Lanarkshire are 912 and in NHS Ayrshire 439. The figures for both Ayrshire and Lanarkshire health boards last year are at four year highs. Following the findings of these freedom of information requests, we submitted further FAIs to um, local authorities and particularly alarmingly, we found that in Glasgow, there was no dog control notices issued in an entire three year period. And in fact, they only had one part time animal control warden employed who is not trained in the dog control legislation. 
I understand that this has now changed and that there is one full-time dog control ward and changed, but I'm sure you'll agree that for uh, the largest local authority in Glasgow, that's not nearly enough. Thank you. I'll maybe invite you to come back in a bit later, Natalie, but would any of the others like to tell your story? Claire, would you like to go yep. first? Um, 2015, my son Ryan, who was six at the time, along with a couple of school friends and another two mums, went a walk near to where we live. It was a rural, semi-rural country lane with houses on it. We were picking chestnuts off the ground. We were all very quiet because we were intent on collecting chestnuts. And from nowhere, a white English bull terrier came running out from trees and knocked Ryan to the ground. Um, where he proceeded to cover his whole body. And very quickly after that, it was followed by another English bull terrier that ran right into him as well. It all happened very quickly. Um, it was carnage at the scene. When I eventually managed to get Ryan, um, a, a man who lives in the houses near, came out to help us, got the dogs off. Noticed right away that his ear was off, his side of his head and a large chunk was missing and it was hanging off. Um, as this was all going on, I was obviously screaming out hysterical and the owner is in the background, unaware of what's going on, shouting out, don't worry, the dogs won't touch you. Um, there was blood everywhere. Um, children were running about screaming at this point, as they would do. Very quickly then escalated it. We called the police, called an ambulance and ran get blue lighted to, at that time, it was a Royal Alexandra Hospital in Paisley. Um, and the police then dealt with the incident. I was obviously with Ryan that whole time at hospital. Very quickly when we arrived at um, Paisley, we got told we had to go straight to the Children's Hospital in Glasgow, which we then get blue lighted to there. Ryan then went through emergency surgery to attach his ear to his head and to close up the wounds, but they couldn't retach the top of his ear because there's not any blood vessels there to, to reattach it again. So he was left disfigured. He had bites to his hip, his elbow, and teeth marks embedded in the top of his forehead, as well as cuts and grazes all over his body because he'd been right all about the ground. Um, after the, the kind of trauma of that attack, I was left very frustrated in the hospital due to, I felt the police didn't help us out. Um, I felt very frustrated because at the time they took the statements from my friends that were there. Bearing in mind, my friends were trying to get their kids and contain the kids. They weren't seeing fully what was going on. The, dog, the police decided at the scene then to retain one dog, which was white and was covered in blood. They decided not to retain the other one because they said there wasn't sufficient evidence to see that that actually bit my son. But because the two dogs were covering Ryan's full body, you couldn't actually see what one was biting. The only reason they knew that the white one was involved is because it was white and you could see the blood all over it. The other dog was dark brown and black. You couldn't see blood stains on that. The owner of the dog did say that they would give the white dog over because it did have behavioural issues and it had issues around prams, pram wheels and bike wheels and car wheels. And if it ever came into close contact with these, it would go kind of berserk. So there was a, a friend to their, I think of the baby at the time was about nine months old in the pram at the time. So Ryan was standing next to the pram. That is the only indication I've ever got that that is why Ryan got picked because he always asked me kind of on a regular basis, why did the dog attack me and not attack anyone else? Why did it attack me when I wasn't running about, I wasn't shouting, I wasn't screaming, he wasn't doing any of the things that you should say not to do if a dog is running up to you? Um, I was very frustrated with the police and I let them know my frustrations because we then didn't get my statement taken till later on at night and they didn't want to speak to Ryan at all, which I felt he's the victim, he's the one that was lying on the ground, he should have been the one that would have told them what happened. We then ended up, myself and my husband wrote to um, an MSP who lived in the area at the time, who still lives in the area, Annabelle Goldie, and it was her that put a complaint into the Infrastructure Police. And as a result of that, it then got kind of escalated a bit more, and we got visits from the police stating why they, they didn't have any control over it. And basically they told us they haven't got any control when dogs attack, they didn't have the authority to do anything. They wanted badly to retain that other dog, but they didn't have the control to do that. Um, that has then kind of resulted in me putting more complaints into the police, but we haven't got really far with that. Also as well, um, the dog wardens came to visit us. And at the time, that was, they took her statement, 
but, but a week later, the phone us back to ask if they'd left the statement in our house because they couldn't find it. So, again, that was a huge frustration. I phoned them back again to see if they'd found it again, and they apparently had, but I don't know that for sure. So I felt that whole process was kind of a bit farcical, to be honest. Um, with the dog owner, um, he got charged, he got taken to court, and the, the white dog got destroyed, it got taken away and got destroyed, and the second dog got a control order put on it, which meant that it couldn't be walked in Bishopton, where we live, it couldn't be off a lead, it had to be muzzled. Uh, if anyone came to the door, whether it be a delivery postman, any delivery, any members of the public, it had to be retained, it couldn't be anywhere near the front door. It couldn't be in any of the public places within Bishopton. However, the owner moved away from his house and moved to a completely different area and nobody knew where he went, so therefore the control order was never followed up. The dog wardens couldn't get a hold of him to, to do the six monthly check, which they were supposed to do. The dog owner himself um, did get community service of the maximum community service and the judge did say in the day that he was very close to jailing the person, which I felt he should have been because he was a completely irresponsible owner. Um, but because he handed that white dog over, they didn't he escape a jail sentence then. My kind of feelings on the whole, kind of what I feel the law should be is too many people in this country have dogs as they act as if it's a child, if it's a baby, as an extension to their family. And I do understand that to a certain extent. But there is too many people that have dogs that they can't control and they're not they shouldn't be pets, they shouldn't be in houses and they shouldn't be with and with children. I would like to see that in all public places that dogs are kept on leads. It happens in other countries. Why can't it happen here? Um my son, as a result, we can't go to public parks right now because he's terrified of dogs being off the lead. Anywhere that we go, he's terrified of seeing a dog off the lead, and that's resulted in him now getting more counselling and having to kind of, as a family, we're trying to solve that. Um, I also feel then that these people that have these dogs, they shouldn't have them. There should be controls on people to have that. There should be um, a kind of stricter guidelines as to if a dog does attack, what the repercussions could be. Um, also, I'm very strongly against this one free bite rule, which, how do you know if a dog's bitten before? People that live in the community where that brown dog is now living, they don't know what's happened. They don't know what that dog's been involved in. So why should that then be let to go? Um, I also feel as well um, that dogs, that all dog owners should be paying a licence to have a dog, and it shouldn't be as well. You can go into Facebook, you can go into Gumtree and buy a dog, get it for nothing, don't know anything about it. Overall, as well, just for the kind of ongoing trauma for my family, Brian has been left with a disfigurement. He's got another three operations to undergo. Um, one being removing cartilage from his sternum to then attach onto his ear, and then get a skin graft to then rebuild his ear. So that's three separate operations which are ha happening in Edinburgh. We live in Bishopton, so it's a bit of a upheaval for us. Also, as well, the whole traumatic effect of him, it, it has affected his entire childhood. He doesn't want to go to places where he should be thriving to go as a little boy. It's affected our younger children who weren't there at the time, but they're now got a huge fear of dogs. Um, for myself as well, I had a lot of time off work. I've been di I did, was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress. I had to go through cognitive behaviour therapy. All of this is funded in the NHS. Why does, that, why does the NHS have to have that strain? Because of one person who was irresponsible and shouldn't have owned those dogs. Claire, thank you very much indeed. I know it's not easy to, to recount these stories. It's important that we hear your evidence today, so thank you very much. Um, Veronica, would you like to go next? Uh, I'll start off by saying I agree entirely with everything that's just been said. Um, when Kelly died, the laws were ineffective. Nothing happened to anybody. I mean, the owner um, stupidly allowed his daughter and my daughter to take two massive rock violers. I think the combined weight was something like 19 stone and Kelly weighed four and a half stone or something like that. So she didn't stand a chance. The um, injuries that Kelly suffered were such that when we went to see her, we were not allowed to touch her. And it wasn't until much later we realised that she'd actually been decapitated. Um, I think all dogs should be kept on a lead. There should be some kind of measure 
about keeping, some laws about keeping the more powerful dogs because it's not everybody who can control the bigger dogs. All dogs should be kept on a leash. They should be, the lead should, these extending leads, I think when in public places, the lead should only be a maximum of two metres. Um, just for the safety, there should be dog runs in parks where you can take your dog and keep the children out of it and keep them safe. Um, I think that, that's me for now. There's a lot more to be said, but I'm a wee bit of... Just yeah. tell me if you want to come back in, Veronica, OK? Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Lisa, would you like to...? Do it just there. OK, okay. Just got OK, there. OK. Judy Evans. Hi. Um, I've got a picture which maybe should or should not be shown of a small child who had a facial dog bite, which was regarded as a minor injury because as plastic surgeons, we could take that child into theatre, repair the damage in terms of there being no open wound in a less than one hour operation. The child was able to be recovered technically from the anaesthetic and was allowed to go home the same day. That's not a minor injury. Um, that child had scarring, and it is a myth as far as the public are concerned, that children scar better than old people. It's exactly the opposite. Those of us who are old enough know that we've got facial creases where scars can be hidden, but children who've still got to grow have worse scars because their, their tissues are actively growing and their scar tissue grows actively as well. So they will get worse scars, even with the best plastic surgery. So it's a huge problem for that child. And every child who comes in to the plastic surgeons with a dog bite injury or any other injury, it's not just one patient, there are at least five. Because there will be parents, there will be perhaps grandparents. The dog may not have been running wild, but may have been at home where perhaps the grandparents were caring for the dog who had never bitten anybody before. And then there's all the interfamily dynamics of how terrible that is. And it does go on for the rest of that child's life and the rest of the family's life. I would say that it's very rarely a minor injury, even if it's not a life-threatening injury. And as plastic surgeons, we try and do everything we can to support the families um, and to do what we can to pass these concerns on to other agencies. But when a child only comes in as a day case, then we're left with dealing with the next day's day cases. And we don't do enough, although it's not from a lack of wanting to do more. Obviously, we're not the people who are going to be there doing the control of these dogs. We're the people who have to mop up the terrible things that happen because there isn't the control there. Dr Evans, can I just ask you, you represent the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh. Yeah. Um, as well as being a consultant plastic surgeon. So you're able to speak on behalf of surgeons across Scotland. Yeah. We understand that there's been an increase in dog attacks. Have your surgeons seen an increase in the number of operations they are doing as a result of dog attacks? I can't give you any absolute numbers, but obviously junior plastic surgeons look for hot topics to do projects on to find out these sort of figures. And I would say it's the same across the whole of the UK. I've also got papers from Australia which are showing that dog attacks are becoming more frequent. So I think we're looking at, within the UK, hospital admissions roughly doubling in the last 10 years. And do you have any, uh, have you any evidence as to why that is? not in terms of validated figures, mm -hmm. in terms of impressions, it's less, um, less control in the home when children are concerned, um, people having to go out to work rather and leaving dogs inappropriately sometimes happens, um, leaving dogs with people who are not physically fit to control them, those sorts of things. And there's the whole thing of, um, because of, you were talking about a one-bite rule, but if it's a no-bite rule, that doesn't mean that that dog isn't going to get frustrated and attack somebody one day. 
So I don't think you can ever trust a dog just because it hasn't done anything so far. Okay. Lisa, Lisa Grady. Um, my daughter was attacked by two Rottweilers in 2010. She was 10 years old. Um, she was out riding her bike. Uh, she stopped it to cross the road and three Rottweilers actually came round the corner. Two adult Rottweilers and a puppy. She smiled at the puppy because a person in that street had owned this dog and given it back to the people they bought it from because it was shown aggression towards her son. The next thing, the dogs grabbed Rihanna off her bike, um, started biting her. She managed to get up, I think it was two or three times, back to her feet again and they pulled her down again. Um, this all happened in the middle of a road. Um, my mum had seen this from the window, come running down, um, got Rihanna in a dressing gown and said to the dogs, be good. And for some reason, whether they were used to female authority or not, they stopped. Um, my mum got Rihanna in a dressing gown and walked her back across to her house, which was about 20 yards. And Rihanna's saying, my jaw's broken, my leg, my leg. These dogs followed them all the way back to the house and were trying to look through the windows. Um, my niece, who was here at the time as well, actually phoned the police to be told that she would have to phone the dog wardens. And I think it was only after she explained to them how bad Rihanna's injuries looked and they told her to phone an ambulance, which she did. Um, we think the ambulance service actually contacted the police because both turned up at the same time, police and ambulance. Rihanna's clothes had to be cut off. She had bites to the top of her arm, front and back, um, big bite to her leg, her neck had a hole. She had a bite to the side of her face. Her ear was hanging off. Her jaw was also broken in two places and the dogs had forced a tooth out of her mouth. Um, she required surgery for all of that, stitches, which have left quite considerable scarring. And like Dr Evans was saying, the skin continues to grow. So these scars are stretching as she gets older and gets bigger. Um, she will need further operations on the one on her leg and she does want to have the one on her neck looked at too. Um, you can actually see the dots from the stitches on all of our scars because um, she's such a skinny little thing at the time and still is. Her skin's just stretched and it's more visible now. Uh, she had another operation on her jaw around four years ago because she has two metal plates in now and one of them was causing her a lot of discomfort in one side of her jaw. She had to get it filed down um, to ease that discomfort and they've told her if she has any more discomfort and they have to do any, anything else that she will probably suffer nerve damage to the bottom of her face. She might even lose all of her teeth in the bottom. Um, she suffers from anxiety quite a lot. She basically turned into a recluse after the dog attack and she was always out in the street playing. She was always out on her bike constantly. Um, she, she didn't leave the house a lot and when she did she was very anxious. Um, it's only in the last maybe six months or so she's coming out of her shell again and that's because she started a college course in acting and performance and they're dragging it out of her or I think she would have continued to be very introverted, very quiet and she holds a lot inside, she keeps a lot to herself. She did have one visit to a psychologist about a year after it happened, one visit and they said oh she's doing very well, she's, we've never seen anyone cope so well with it they didn't follow up on that and nothing else happened because of it. But she's still, she's still suffering now, I think, physically and mentally, and there will be more operations in the future. Can I ask um, if any members would like to come in with a question? Um, Natalie, you want to add some? Yeah, yes. I just wanted to, to draw on, on two points that, that Lisa and Claire both raised. The first is around the emotional impact that these attacks have. I have interviewed many families who are in similar situations and that is the very first thing that they tell me is long after, you know, the the wounds have been patched up and the stitches have been taken out. It's the emotional impact of these attacks that is the longest lasting. The second point I wanted to make um, is something that, that Claire and Lisa again both brought up and that is the confusion around who is responsible for controlling dogs. The police 
seem to think it's the local authorities and the local authorities seem to think it's a police and that is a very common theme throughout all the, the, the cases that I've dealt with over the course of Lead the Way. Thank you, Natalie. Dr Alistair Corfield, you are from the Royal College of Emergency Medicine, so you represent all the doctors in the A&E departments up and down the country who receive people with dog attacks and who treat them. Can, can you tell us your perspective, please? Um, it's difficult for me to actually, I think, add anything more about the physical and psychological effects on patients beyond the three stories we've heard this morning. I think that very accurately describes the impact uh, that dog bites have on patients. And I suppose my reflection is that that happens probably 5,000 times a year in Scotland. To individual, and there's 5,000 individual stories every year, um, like we've heard this morning. Perhaps not quite of that severity, but significant. And I suppose the other reflection on that is that I'm pretty sure, although again it's difficult to get figures in this, there's also a number of people that never come to an emergency department following a dog bite, particularly of the lower acuity. And that makes me wonder about this one bite rule as to how, how do you judge when a bite is a bite? Is it a bite that requires medical attention or is it just any sort of bite? So from our point of view, in emergency medicine, it's a workload, perhaps compared to some of our other major uh, health problems, it's not a major part of our workload, but certainly every time it happens it is a significant event um, because it's not a pleasant thing to be involved with dealing with, particularly when it's children and, and treating. So from our point of view, we would see it as like many of the problems that attend our emergency departments, it's a public health issue, this. It requires a a coordinated approach to, to deal with it. And do you have any ideas what that approach might be, Dr Corfield? Um, again, public health is an interest of mine, but not an area of my expertise. But I think it's like, again, many other problems that attend our emergency departments. It requires joined up thinking between social services, justice, the police and health to, to deal with it. Dr. Corfield, you said it was um, particularly distressing when it's children, and you also said there are about 5,000 incidents of dog attack bites coming through your emergency departments every year. Can you give us any idea what proportion of that 5,000 is children? So again, I don't have those figures personally. Again, based on the figures that have been presented to the committee, about 20% of dog bites are children. Sorry, I didn't catch so, which percent, sorry. So again, based on the figures that Natalie's presented, which come from my health board in Ayrshire and Aaron, about 20% of all the dog bites are affect children. So again, if you were to extrapolate that, and again, I haven't done this, but you would estimate it would be about a thousand a year in Scotland. Dr Evans. Yeah, I'd just like to make the point that because children <coughs> are generally smaller than adults and their faces are nearer to the ground, um, a percentage of how many injuries our children is making it seem less important because facial injuries are so difficult to hide. So there are going to be a greater percentage of the injuries will be facial injuries in people who are not as tall as the people who are six foot tall who maybe have a hand injury or a leg injury. <coughs> not to minimise those, but just to put that in context. Alex Neal. Can I ask the, the two doctors uh, if you see any patterns? I mean, in the horrific stories we've heard this morning, it so happened that every, in every case it was Rottweilers who were the culprits. But as we know, the original legislation that was passed, it dealt with the breed rather than the deed. Um, you know, it could be any breed of dog. It could be small dogs as well as big dogs, etc. But in terms of the people who present to a &E or to plastic surgery, is there any pattern, uh, for example, uh, in terms of the kind of dogs who attack, uh, the, the, the circumstances in which they attack, the circumstances of the owners? Is there any pattern that you can discern that is, would be worthwhile looking at? I'd say absolutely not. Um, there are quite a lot of small dogs who are confined, who get frustrated, who then attack. So it's definitely not only the big dogs. That completely. I think it's yeah. there's lots of different circumstances where dog attacks occur. It's not just down to the breed. 
and in the circumstances in which the attacks take place, are they generally out in public places, are they in the home, or are the family dogs that attack other members of the family, or is it, I mean, this morning all the stories have been about people who have been out and attacked by dogs they didn't know, basically. And I, can, I don't have figures to back this up. My, right. my experience is that it's probably fairly evenly split between right. sort of domestic so no family circumstances pattern. and right. sort of in the public place. Yeah. It could happen any time, anywhere, by anybody, basically. Lisa Grady. Sorry, you were asking whether um, it's whether dogs that attack in the home or... Sorry. Lisa, on you. Um, he was asking whether it was dogs that attack, whether they're, whether they're out and about or in the home. The dogs that attacked my daughter had actually escaped from an enclosed garden on the morning. The owner wasn't even aware that they were out. Um, and just to add as well, these one of these dogs, I think, I believe maybe both of them had a control order against them already. So they'd already had their one by one free bite. Mm -hmm. Claire Booth. Talking about the, um, the breed, not the deed. I actually don't agree with that. Um, I think it is the breed of dogs. Right. The dogs that were mentioned here are Rottweilers and Mackies and English Bull Terriers. When you see it in press, it all tends to be these very muscular, very powerful dogs that are capable of locking their jaws, and their jaws are very powerful. You don't tend to hear about a Labrador or a Collie or a Maltese you know, type, small type dogs. These big dogs are big and powerful and shouldn't be in people's small homes because a lot of people have them in little flats. They don't have the facilities to care for them. These breed, these are the breeds I feel that need to have a ban on them. They, yeah. they shouldn't be able, people shouldn't be able to get these the way they can get them. Yeah. That's how I, I personally feel. Natalie Crawford. I just wanted to add on a, a previous point um, of Dr Corfield about the, the number of, of people who are going to accident and emergency departments with these types of injuries for Glasgow and the West, which is Radio Clyde's broadcast area, so NHS Greater Glasgow Clyde, Ayrshire and Lanarkshire for 2018. It was nine people a day. At least one of those every single day of 2018 was a child. Veronica Lynch. Um, our younger son last, last winter, in the course of his work, went to a house uh, as he's a, an estate agent and he went into this flat and there was a lot Rottweiler there and it immediately attacked him. Uh, he had on, unfortunately, he had on a really thick jacket so there was only one tiny puncture wound but his arm was black and blue, really quite bad. Because of what happened to his sister, um, he refused point blank. He just could not face going through any more trauma. So he's another one who, another attack which was not reported and simply because of the psychological damage that he'd suffered with losing his sister. So they, I, I believe there are a lot of attacks which go un unreported. People are just too frightened of repercussions or whatever. And Veronica, that's like Claire was saying, that's a, another Rottweiler, big muscular mm, dog yeah. kept in a small confined... Yeah. Space. In, in a way, I do believe that it's the, the deed, but the breed does matter because a way Yorkshire Terrier, it, whilst it can inflict painful damage, it can, it's unlikely to rip the throat out of any child because by the time it got near to doing that, it would be stopped. They're manageable. Big dogs are too powerful. When their jaws lock, you cannot remove them. Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. There's a couple of uh, recurring themes that I'd be interested in hearing the panel's views on, and one is one that I've actually uh, come across in my own constituency, and that's the confusion between the roles and the responsibilities of the local council and the police. Do you think there is sufficient knowledge within the lo local authorities, the public and the police, to understand where to report these things, you know, these incidents? I think there is some confusion there because there was a, a wee boy in Dundee last year who was attra attacked by a rottweiler and suffered horrendous uh, injuries. And the police were called and they said that no criminal um, 
problem had occurred. So there was no charges, but there was a public outcry. So the police went back after telling the parents to contact the local council. The police went back and charged the, the, mat, the owner of the dog. The dog was taken away and put into a police pound or something, and then the owner died, so there were no charges, no more proceedings. So the dog was put back to the house from where it came, and that wee boy lived in the same street. And his life is pretty difficult, having to see that dog every day. So there's real confusion there over the powers of the police and who should be in yeah. charge. Yes. Yeah. Natalie Crawford. Certainly what I've found in a lot of cases is that when people go to the police to report these types of incidents, they're often referred back to the local authority because of the Control of Dogs Act. Um, but as, as I said at the big beginning of this session, in areas like Glasgow for the last three years, there's been no dog control warden who was trained to deal with this legislation. So if there's nobody there... To, to input the, the legislation, then who do people turn to? Okay, I'm going to take Alistair Corfield, please. Dr Corfield. Thank you. I just want to clarify my answer from earlier on, just when we were talking about the number of injuries. So I suppose the point I was making was that any breed of dog can inflict an injury, and that's the pattern that we see. But I would agree that the more significant injuries that I've seen, as a personal experience, are from the bigger, more muscular dogs. Thank you. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. A um, couple of questions, one arising a bit to the two medical professionals, um, but arising from something that Lisa Grady said. Um, if someone presents at A&E uh, with, with uh, these sorts of injuries, or indeed at their, their GP, uh, is there any guidance in place? Is there any obligation on the NHS to get in touch with the police and say, this has happened, uh, you need to do something? Or is the NHS completely in a silo of treating the injury and then leaving it there? So we are not obliged to report to the police unless there's been a threat to life um, or a public order issue. It would be it's the same as any assault. I think it's how we would approach it. So if there's been serious injury, um, we would report it to the police, but um, for the majority of cases, the police would not be contacted by us. So you're not obliged to. Do you think, uh, and I appreciate I'm asking you a personal view, Dr Corfield, uh, should there be some kind of obligation such that uh, we can actually get some... Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very much persuaded because I've, I've seen it myself of attacks happening and not being reported. Surely the NHS ought to have a duty to report to the police. Do you agree? So there are some issues around that. Uh, as I say, we would approach it in the same way that we approach interpersonal violence between people. That the the sort of public benefit has to outweigh the the risk of breaching patient confidentiality. Um, so I can understand why you're making that point. I think that there are some issues, legal issues that would have to be, or ethical issues rather is the right phrase, that would have to be thought about before we could do that routinely. And I also think that, as we've heard from the other members here and other witnesses here, there has to be some clarity that the police actually have responsibility for dealing with that because, again, my personal experience is unless it's something that's serious, life-threatening or public order is involved, the police would not necessarily see that as their role to respond. Dr Evans. Of course, our primary responsibility is patient confidentiality and I've had numerous experiences where the relatives of a child will not want the police involved because it's a family dog. So we can't go against their wishes. I understand. Does anyone else, just before I move on to just a, a separate question, does anyone else want to say anything about that? Whether the NHS should have a duty to report? 
I feel if the, it's not a family member, in our cases, they weren't our dogs, then yeah, they, they should be. But I know in our cases, the police were involved. But if the attack happened and the person goes into the hospital, it's clearly that it's not been a family dog or they didn't know the dog, then yeah, I feel the police should be reported by them if it hadn't already been reported before. <coughs> uh, slightly different tack, which I'll, I'll put to Natalie Crawford, if I may, just on, on some of the points that were being raised about the breed. Uh, my understanding, or can you tell me, is, isn't there evidence uh, that certain breeds have a predisposition to certain uh, behaviours, which, which I think was the impetus behind the Dangerous Dogs Act in the first place? Uh, and if so, doesn't that lend credence to this argument that there are certain breeds that we should particularly single out uh, for uh, restriction? to some extent. As you um, alluded to, that was the, the role, the, the responsibility of, of the, the Dangerous Dogs Act. My concern is with the control of Dogs Act, which, as Mr Neil said, the focus of is deed, not breed. The, the real, real issue that I see is that the control of Dogs Act is not being enforced properly by local authorities. Either they're not aware of what their responsibilities are, or they're not taking them seriously enough. And I think that is really where the focus needs to be before we start looking at separate legislation of the Dangerous Dogs Act. But just, I, I guess the, the thing I'm proposing is, if evidentially there are certain breeds of dog that are predisposed to this sort of behaviour, doesn't there come a point where you say, these are not pets? these should not be permitted to be kept as pets uh, rather than saying well okay have them as pets but then seek to control them later on I just put that out there as a possibility I, I can't speak to that because that's not within the realm of my expertise but what I can say is that the, the nine or ten different families that I've spoken to over the course of this campaign the, the dogs uh, at the centre of them have been these big powerful breeds Thank you. And I'll start with um, I've been struck by um, all the, particularly the, the personal stories as a, a parent of three young children. You can't help but imagine if that was your own child. Um, and actually just this past weekend, I was with my own three children in a um, local play park, which is uh, protected by uh, a, gate, a gate and fencing around it. But there was a, a very large dog who was clearly not in control uh, or not controlled by the dog owner. Uh, probably bigger, stronger than, than the actual owner was, who came into the play park, uh, clearly frightened the children, knocked one child over, um, really traumatised another child, not my own, but another child, um, by running towards it. Um, and I, I've got no doubt that that child will have um, an impact, even though there was no bite, there was no uh, any injury, I've got no doubt that child will be traumatised for years and years to come when it's around the play park. Um, and I'm struck by what Claire said around people can go on to, to Gumtree or Facebook and, and acquire a, a dog um, and view them as children. The reality is there's some people that, that the state deems aren't fit enough to be parents and their children are taken away from them. Um, whereas, where is the control around whether someone's fit to be a dog owner? Um, and I think there's been a lot of focus this morning, uh, understandably, on, on the breed of dog and the dog itself, but less on the competence of an individual that is in charge or in control um, of that pet. Clearly there are people who should not be anywhere near children and there are people that should be nowhere near any kind of pet or any kind of dog. Um, is that something that is reflected from the people around the table? Um, this lady I, that was in charge of this dog at the weekend, there is no way she could control that dog. The dog, if, Even if the dog was on a lead, which it wasn't, which it should have been, if the dog was on the lead, she would no way have been able to control the dog. The dog would have dragged her around the park uh, as well. Is there something around people being competent enough to be dog owners that needs to be looked at as well? Would anyone like to respond to that? Lisa. Um, the two people that had the dogs that attacked my daughter, they had five kids of their own too, but they were breeding these dogs and selling them. They were actually kept in sheds and back gardens. We'd heard several stories from neighbours. Um, after the attack, the dogs were destroyed. Um, the case went to trial. Um, against the woman was not prosed and the, the 
man, Derek Adams, found guilty and sentenced to 12 months. At the trial, under oath, Sarah Kerr had said that she could not control these dogs. She didn't know why her partner kept leaving her in charge of them. Uh, that they would pull her off her feet was the quote that she used while she was on the stand. After the trial was finished, it only took about two weeks for her to have another Rottweiler that was sat at the window constantly every time we drove past, or anybody drove past. We actually phoned the police who did go and visit her, and she ended up surrendering the dog, but only voluntarily. They couldn't take it off of her because she was not proven. She had nothing. She had no control order or anything put on, no ban, nothing. So if she hadn't surrendered that over, there was an owner that was basically admitting that she couldn't control these dogs. They would pull her off her feet if they wanted to, and yet she'd went and got another one after everything that happened. So she obviously not a responsible dog owner for that type of breed. Do you think there should be licensing in terms of if you are a dog owner and licensing and registering the dog, uh, a license and register if you are a, a, a breeder or a, or a dog owner, should that, and then banning orders and control orders, etc., much more robustly? Yeah, I, I definitely think for larger breeds, definitely, if they're not going to put a total ban on these dogs, they have to do something to make the owners take responsibility. There has to be harsher, harsher penalties. These control orders I don't think are effective at all. Let's see, these dogs had a control order on them already and they breached it. They were the type of people that would have breached regardless. They wouldn't have paid attention. We don't even know if they were being monitored at all after the first control order was issued. And if they were, who was monitoring? If they were seen out of control, who did people report it to? Was it the neighbours? Was it, you know, do you report it to the warden? Do you report it to the police? Um, I think if, they, if these types of dogs in particular, if not all, had to have a licence, it would make people be a bit more responsible. I, th I do think the owners of these types of dogs need to be looked at because in a lot of cases it's used as a status symbol. Both, and then Veronica. I totally agree with everything that's said. Um, I do think there has to be stricter controls. But my concern is who's going to fund these controls and where is the staffing going to come from? Because right now, everything is getting cut right across local governments, local councils. So how, how's it all going to get funded? <coughs> Veronica Lynch. Yeah, I, I, what I'm thinking is that everything that people are speaking about, n nothing can stop the attacks. Like, a licence will not stop the attack. A licence can perhaps fund more dog wardens and all the rest of it. The place to start, well, the place to stop the attacks is to start by making all dogs be on Norwegian public places, and you can see at a glance that the law's been broken if the dog's not on a lead. The larger breeds, I would advocate for muzzles for them, because they, they can inflict much more damage because of their size and their power. But I do think that all dogs should be on a lead at all times in public. I think there's a, a principle in our law that good law is clear law. And I think, Veronica, you're evidence there just spoke exactly to that. People know what the situation is if the law is clear, if certain breeds need to be muzzled or if it's leads or if they're not allowed within children's play areas, which I think certain local councils do. But there's a real lack of clarity, I think, from what we're hearing this morning about the law right across the country, even to the extent that the people in charge of enforcing the law don't know their own powers, the police and, and the councils. Bill Bowman, I think you wanted to come in. Yeah, I would like to ask Claire something, if I, if I may. I think you, you spoke about um, the owner of the dog had a, an, an order and then they moved away. Yes, and and did you, do you think people then lost sight of them? They did, because the dog warden couldn't trace them. Um, they couldn't then follow up. They did a six month um, review to follow up to make sure that the owner had taken the dog to training classes and was following everything up. But because they didn't know where they stayed, they couldn't then follow that person up. And do you think they moved away from your district? Was that the issue rather than they just moved to the next street or something? No, like they, moved, they completely moved out of the whole area. Uh -huh. It was in the, the papers and the people in, in the street um, who lived there. This is after the, the fact that we found this out. Um, by chance, one of their neighbours was my son's football coach and he didn't realise that Ryan was attacked with the, the, his neighbour's dogs. And then when he then told us that the neighbour had moved away, he also told us that he terrorised the entire street with the dogs. He intentionally put people at fear with these dogs. 
So once it then, I think, hit the newspapers that he had been charged, he's, the dogs were involved in a, an attack, he then moved away. I wonder if, Natalie, is that something that's come out in your campaign? Yeah. The, the, the issue with these dog control notices is they're obviously issued by the local authority, but if somebody moves out with that local authority area, there's no central system, there's no um, process for it being passed on to the, the new area's dog control notice. In fact, there's no way for... a, a dog control warden to even know that a person who is subject to one of these orders has moved. So have you asked the local authority who has a dog control order in that area? Well, the, obviously in, in Clyde, we're, our broadcast area is Glasgow, and for the last three years they've not issued any dog control notices. Right. <coughs> okay. Can I also just add to that? Um, at the time when we went to court and made a meeting with the procurator fiscal, the law in Scotland had came into force where all dogs had to be microchipped. And I asked then, would that control order be put on the microchip so that if anything happened, it could get scanned and could see? He didn't know that information, but I think that turns out that no, that doesn't happen. Can I just ask a slightly different matter? You've spoken about the psychological effects of on your family or the people involved. Did you, were you ever offered support in that area or did you have to go and seek it or how did that come about? When I was in hospital with Ryan um, I basically demanded that Ryan gets referred to a child psychologist because I knew the long term effect that this could have had on him. We did get referred to a child the psychologist only because Ryan had trouble sleeping at night and when she then spoke to him again very similar to what happened with Lisa it was one visit she said that there was no issues he was doing very well at school um, he was enjoying his playing in his football team and attending Cubs, which are both in controlled areas, that he should just continue with that. So we had to seek that out. The only kind of support that we got, and again, it was the hospital staff that gave it to us, was um, we dealing with a charity called Changing Faces, which helped with people with disfigurements. And they gave us a lot of support um, on how Ryan looks now, because he does suffer um, people looking at him, staring at him, very unwanted staring. Um, he's been called names as a result of how he looks. Thank you. Willie Coffey. Thanks, Jenny. I mean, it's quite harrowing what I'm hearing this morning. I find it really quite difficult to, to, to even understand the pain that the families have went through with this. Um, clearly, change in legislation will help us to enforce and, and punish. Uh, but I think, as Veronica was saying, it, it's not going to stop attacks, and it probably wouldn't have stopped these three attacks occurring, so I was hoping to kind of explore a wee bit more with our colleagues, Jenny, the kind of preventions that, that might begin to influence this, to bring this down. And Claire, you've spoken about banning certain breeds, and Veronica, you've spoken about compulsory muzzling and restricting lead lengths and so on and so forth. Is there any more ideas that colleagues could share with us that, that might help to reduce these kinds of attacks? We shouldn't re totally rely on legislation solving this because it won't. Claire, what do, oh, you, sorry, what do you think? No, sorry. Uh, any of you, um, please. You know, any, yeah. do, sorry, do you want me to any suggestions that I've yes, got? Please. Yeah, yes, um, please, yeah. I think really the, the big thing for me was having a, all dogs in public places on leads and just making that the law. That it just can't. You can't have a dog running about. You can't have a dog outside anywhere unless it's an elite. That's that was the, the big one thing for me. Um, I think as well that I feel the control orders are a waste of time. They don't work. There isn't anyone to enforce them, and it hasn't worked for me. And it probably hasn't worked for anyone else. Um, the big thing for me as well is stricter controls in getting a dog. Um, not that long ago, my sister looked about getting a cat, a house cat. And she approached the Cat Protection League and they came out and vetted her and says, no, you can't have a cat because you live in a flat. That's it. So that is, how can that not happen for dogs? They need to stop all these breedings. I think a lot of breeders have to be actual recognised breeders with stricter controls in them. And that is the only person you can go to if you want a dog. But they've been through checks. They know how to deal with dogs. They're behavioural specialists as well with dogs. But they can also whether that person's fit to have a dog and look at their surroundings to see is it fit and suitable, if they've got children um, if they've got a back garden are they living in a small flat I think these are where the, the kind of law has to change I don't know if that's you can get enforced 
I know it would be difficult to do, but I think we need to start at the root of the problem, and the root of the problem is people breeding dogs and giving them out to anyone that wants them and not understanding how to control them. Lisa and Veronica, have you some other ideas that you could offer? To would anyone else like to respond to Willie's question? Mm. Lisa? Um, I think I would agree with Claire as well um, about, about the breeders. Let's see, these couple that owned the dogs that attacked Joanna were breeding these dogs for a, quite a considerable amount of time. Um, and people around the entire area were buying these things for pennies, from what I understand. At one point, they actually were practically giving them away because um, they couldn't find a vet to dock the tails anymore and people didn't want to pay for them. So because these dogs had tails, they were practically giving them away for free. So I would agree that I think something does need to be looked into um, breeders, um, something needs to be done about maybe to try to control that in some way. Uh, how you would do that, I, I couldn't give a suggestion. Yeah. Veronica, have you any more offerings you could you could suggest for us? Um, I just kind of agree with everything um, that other people are saying. I mean, we have to start somewhere, and we have to start soon to try to prevent these attacks from happening. Um, the bre some breeders are unscrupulous. They really have to be vetted a bit more. Um, but from today, I would like to see something more proactive than reactive, because it's a reactive method that we've been working on for so long. 30 years on from Kelly's death, we're still reading the same headlines. Nothing has changed, and we have to get something done. It's OK sitting around talking about it, but we really, really need something, some action. I think that's a, a good note to, to wind up on, I think, that call call for action. I, I think, Alec Neil, you were keen to try and summarise? Well, it was just a quick question. I mean, uh, do you think we need to toughen up the punishment for the owners, or indeed people? It's not always the owners. It could be somebody they've put in charge of the dog. You know, it's not always the owner, for example, who has the dog in the public place. It could be somebody the owner has... Uh, given the dog to for a period, but whoever is responsible for the offence, it seems to me the sentences for the more extreme attacks are very light indeed and need to be substantially strengthened. I mean, that probably is a bit of uh, a prevention measure. I mean, it's the prevention impact of tougher sentences in the hope that you don't have to use the tougher sentences because folk have learned their lesson. Would, do you think tougher sentences is part of the solution? Yeah, I agree with that. But again, look at Scottish prisons right now. They're bursting at the seams. Yeah. Who's going to go into jail? Someone that's murdered someone? Or an owner of a dog? So again, they need to look at the bigger picture for that. But I do think there should be tougher sentences. Yeah. I think the best way to hit that would be a financial, a very hefty financial fine. Yeah. Because then the person will have to pay it and they would think again, hopefully. I would like to see a much stricter preventative regime and it's this committee we've undertaken to do some work on this and the evidence that you have given us this morning and I know that this evidence hasn't been easy to give. Um, can I thank you all very much indeed for coming this morning, for sharing your stories um, and for doing so with such patience and fortitude. We really appreciate it. We're about to take some more evidence from a second panel. You're welcome to stay and listen to that evidence if you so wish in the public gallery just behind you, or you're welcome uh, to leave Parliament now. But can I thank you again very much indeed, and I now suspend the committee to allow a changeover of witnesses. Thank you.
Okay, this is still item two, and it's a post-legislative scrutiny control of dogs Act 2010, and we are taking evidence this morning from our second panel. I believe that all of the witnesses were in the public gallery for the first panel of evidence, so I don't need to run through um, how we're going to work, but um, instead of the MSPs introducing themselves, maybe I'll ask the witnesses to introduce themselves this morning, starting with Gemma. Um, I'm Gemma Cooper, I'm head of the policy team for the National Farmers Union. I'm Melissa Donald, I'm the Scottish branch president of the British Veterinary Association. I'm Mike Flynn, Chief Superintendent of the Scottish SPCA. I'm Dave Joyce, I'm the National Health and Safety Officer of the Communication Workers Union. I'm Alison Robertson, I'm a dog warden in Aberdeenshire and I'm here representing the National Dog Warden Association Scotland. Thank you very much indeed. Would any of you like to go first and give us your evidence this morning? Introductory remarks? Mike Flynn? Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I have to, going back to 2009 when Alex first brought this in, we really welcomed it um, because it is meant to be preventative. Uh, we've dealt with the Dangerous Dogs Act, which is a really stupid and ineffectual piece of legislation. Um, you cannot blame um, the breed of a dog because if you want to add to that, you should see some of the dogs that are coming in now. These American Bulldogs, the Canary Corsos, they make Rottweilers look um, uh, timid. Part of the problem uh, with the Control of Dogs Act, as I say, we welcomed it coming in. Every attack, nearly every attack that you've read of before since then, you will always get somebody coming out the woodwork to the press saying, I could have told you that would have happened. People know nine times out of ten that somebody can't control their dog. We exist to protect the welfare of animals, but you will not get any SSPC employee or inspector sticking up for an irresponsible dog owner. Um, if we cannot protect the public, we'll never be able to protect the pets that are out there. Had this been implemented properly, um, some of the problems you heard today, the lady up here, where the dog disappeared to a different area, if the database had been put in a position, that would have been traceable because it is a offence under this to not notify if you're moving address. But without that database, nobody's ever going to know. Um, the penalties in this are very small, but the biggest problem, we've got people like Alison here, uh, who's one of the most knowledgeable dog wardens in the country. She's as rare as her hen's teeth. There is none. You just heard the lady from Radio Clyde saying they've now got one person covering the whole of Glasgow. You can have as many as you like if they don't know dogs' behaviour and what dogs' owners should be, how they should be behaving. It's not going to be successful. You cannot just put this on somebody else's job title. Thank you, Mike. Alison, would you like to...? Yeah. Um... When, when they were bringing in the act, the, the Scottish Government, to their credit, consulted quite widely with the National Dog Warden Association Scotland as a, as a national body. They came along, they discussed what was needed, and I think they listened to us a fair extent. However, it was sold to the local authority and, and to the dog wardens as being uh, basically ASBOs for dogs, and it was aimed at dealing with dogs who were out of control before they got to the point of ever been anywhere as serious as these attacks that we've been discussing this morning um, and in general it's it's we we tend to deal more with dog on dog attacks rather than attacks on people because the, the control of dog scotland act is a civil bit of legislation the can the dog control notices are civil notices um, so if, if we issue a dog control notice because of an act that the dog has carried out that is the end of the matter as long as the owner complies with the notice then there are, there are no um, other repercussions for the dog owner. Clearly, in more serious attacks, they, they obviously have to go to court and it has to be dealt with as a criminal act. Um, that would be the first thing. With referring to the database that wasn't set up, that was a big miss because we, other than local authorities speaking to each other, and unless we know where somebody has gone, we can't do that. And the other, the other problem is that the... the if I issue a dog control notice in Aberdeenshire, it is only effective within the boundary of Aberdeenshire. It's, if somebody moves into the city, and we cross these boundaries all the time, it's not effective in Aberdeen City. We have to tell the Aberdeen City dog warden, who will then put one on if the, you know, the dog spends half its time in the city. It would be helpful if the notices were effective throughout the whole of Scotland, or indeed Britain. Um, that would reduce 
perhaps help the control because then even if the owner moved and didn't notify us that they had moved, it would still be in effect. Because if they breach a notice, it's a, it's a criminal offence and they can be reported for that. Okay, thank you. Dave Joyce. Um, the Communication Workers' Union is the largest uh, trade union in the communications industry. We represent 200,000 workers across the UK and 9,000 employed by Royal Mail and Parcels here in Scotland. We have 95,000 postmen and women on the streets of the UK six days a week, 52 weeks of the year. And as such, we are in the front line when it comes to being confronted by irresponsible owners with out-of-control dogs. And therefore, it, um, we unfortunately have the, uh, you know, we have the the title of being, if you like, the number one stakeholder in relation to um, dog control problems because we represent so many people and see so many devastating attacks. 250 people um, are postmen and women are attacked by dogs every year, year on year, here in Scotland. 3,000 postmen and women are attacked by dogs every year across the United Kingdom. Some of those attacks are so serious, both physically and mentally, that those people cannot continue in their job uh, as a postman or postwoman. And as a result of that, we struggle with this issue on a, on a daily basis. All members will have received my dog attacks on postal workers booklet. You've all received that. A nice pre-reading for you. Uh, you will also receive last year three letters from me and two briefing documents uh, before the um, excellent debate that took place in the Scottish Parliament on the 8th of May to discuss this very important issue. And more recently, you will have received the two most recent uh, dog attacks on, on postal workers, and you can see the devastating injuries that two of our members have recently received, Lynn Ferguson in the Lovians and John Diggy in Dumfries. You will see that they've received life-changing injuries as a result of recent attacks which have taken place. Um, and um, we still don't know as a result of the injuries that they've received whether they're going to be able to actually... They are life-changing injuries. They are, going to, they are going to be disabled for the rest of their life. They are going to be badly scarred, uh, particularly down on our face. Um, we're not sure at this stage whether they're going to be able, particularly in John's case, whether they're going to be able to continue to work as postal workers and do their everyday job. We do have a serious problem in relation to um, dog control legislation. And the lack of enforcement... Um, in, uh, in Scotland. The misinterpretation of dog control law uh, is at the root cause of the major crisis, and it is a major crisis. Dog control uh, and dog attacks are, are out of control across the country, um, and it's no good dodging that issue. But um, certainly misinterpretation of the law is at the root cause of the crisis we've got here in Scotland. Um, and we can see the 80% increase in dog attacks in the last decade is as a result of that. The legislation, the Dangerous Dogs Act of 1991 and the Control of Scotland Act 2010, um, they're just, um, they, uh, they're not working for us, they're not delivering the results, they're not protecting postal workers. Um, and incredibly, although it doesn't require it, um, you know, the, those enforcing the legislation in Scotland currently require, firstly, proof that the person in charge of the dog believed that the dog would actually attack someone, and secondly, um, that there is corroborated evidence existing that a previous bite, attack or bad temperament existed. And we've spoken about this on many occasions and it came up again this morning, this one free bite rule that's applied in Scotland, which is actually uh, reflected nowhere in any legislation, in any legal guidance, in any sentencing um, um, advice, uh, is, is applied by... Um, the, you know, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and, and the police. And as a result of this, many victims of very serious dog attacks and very serious injuries uh, do not get justice uh, for the offences that are actually, um, are actually committed um, by the owners of the dogs against them. And um, this, is, it, this is extremely serious. And of course, the police themselves, and if you look at the submission that was made by Police Scotland, it actually details this actually quite graphically. And, a good, and, and, and the, you know, the scrutiny committee, uh, indeed, the government should be extremely concerned about the, about the situation and, in fact, what the police are actually saying. Because the police undertook a, a, a survey of their 13 policing divisions across Scotland. And several of the divisions c c c reported total confusion amongst their own officers regarding the correct legislation to use when dealing with dangerous dogs. What they're saying is that police officers don't understand the law which they're expected to actually enforce. And they go on to say that um, the 
uh, a number of examples uh, of dog control notices, for example, are being breached, but the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service decline to pursue those cases any further. So even dog control notices, when they're served, are not being enforced. And they also recalled there that a meeting took place between the police and the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service to discuss the overall service delivery of dog control legislation and public protection provisions as not being provided adequately in this country, or robustly, as the police would prefer. And the Procurator Fiscal said quite clearly that it would not and could not prosecute one-off dog bites. I mean, think about what they're actually saying. The Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service is saying they're not going to, pro they're not going to prosecute one-off dog bites, and they should be dealt with through dog control notices. And we all know that dog control notices are actually introduced as a preventative measure. But what we've got is this ping-pong situation going on between the police, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and the local authorities on who should actually um, deal with the law. And I'm going to finish on this and I'll come back. number of points. Police and the Crown Office, Pro police and, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service don't understand the law. In their own words, they don't understand the law. First point. Second point. The Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service declines to deal with DCM breaches. The Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service will not prosecute one-off dog bites, the one free bite rule. The Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service states most cases should be dealt with through a dog control notice when we know they shouldn't. And I'll leave it there, but I want to come back with other information later on. Thank you very much, Dave, for, for your evidence. We know that your workers are at the front line of this every day, and so it, it's good to, good to have your evidence. Melissa Donald, you're from the British Veterinary Association. So we strongly support a deed not breed approach uh, to irresponsible dog ownership and support the Act's current provision for local authorities to impose measures on an owner, on the person in charge of the dog who fails to keep the dog under control through the dog control notices. Because at the end of the day, it is the human in charge of the dog. It's not the dog's fault. It is the human's fault who is in charge of that dog. However, we are concerned that due to a lack of resources, this provision hasn't been effectively enforced. And so we've yet to see the Act achieve its intended impact on promoting responsible dog ownership, reducing the dog attacks and increasing public safety. But fundamentally, we need a holistic approach. It's, you know, as it was said earlier, the prisons are already full, the courts are busy, let's try and prevent it rather than actually use the stick. So we need adequately resourcing local authorities through ring fence funding so they can take consistent methods so that the people can be adequately trained to a, the right level. Um, we need to be able to tackle irresponsible ownership before it becomes a problem, i.e. through the DCNs, so listing the signs of aggression and what is acceptable behaviour contracts. We also would like improved awareness of the Control of Dogs Act to reinforce to all owners they have a legal responsibility to ensure their dog, regardless of breed or type or where they live, that it doesn't become dangerously out of control. Do this through promoting education of responsible dog ownership and how to achieve safe interactions between owners, family members, the public. And you've already the Scottish Government has done brilliant work with the puppy campaign on Buy a Puppy Safely, uh, um, which has just been done recently. And we need to inform responsible ownership and dog bite prevention programmes with evidence generated from further investigation into dog bite incidents. And all this fits in very well with some of the work that Emma Harper, MSP, is already doing. So to me, it's all about prevention, not blaming the dog and getting the owners to know where, what, what it's at. Thank you very much indeed. Um, since you mentioned Emma Harper's bill, I think the consultation was launched this morning and it's about dog attacks on livestock, I believe. Um, this morning, so far, we've heard predominantly about attacks on, on humans and children, but we also have Gemma Cooper with us this morning, who is from the National Farmers Union. I think your concern is about dog attacks on livestock. Is that right, Gemma? Yeah, it is exactly. And yeah, we're, we're really we're pleased to see Emma's bill launching today because I think it will go some of the way um, to addressing some of the issues that we'll, we will outline. Um, I will echo what Mike said, and we definitely welcome the spirit of the Act. Um, I think the context that we have is over the last two years, 
we've seen a 67% increase in attacks on livestock. So the, the cost to industry is really vast. I mean, it's a Scotland-wide issue. Um, it is focused more in certain areas than others. Um, one of the major issues, I think, is the lack of understanding by dog owners as to what is acceptable. Um, in terms of other legislation, we uh, would refer to the Scottish Outdoor Access Code, which is the 2003 Land Reform Act. Um, and somebody said earlier it's about being clear. And in terms of dog access around livestock, um, that directs the public to have their dogs on a lead or under close control. So it gives them a choice. Um, and it's basically not clear enough. So we're certainly lobbying that um, if you have your dog in a field, particularly around sheep, that it must be on a lead. There has to be clearer guidance on that. Um, in terms of the dog control notices, um, I do think that they are a useful interim step in that they do require only a civil burden of proof. Um, but certainly what we've found is that they're not widely used by local authorities and that the level of understanding amongst dog wardens seems to vary and amongst the police, I would say. Um, I mean, we got figures by an FY request and the six months from 1st of December 2017 to 31st May 2018, there were 26 for the whole Scotland for livestock worrying. 12 were issued in Argyll and Butte, which would suggest that the dog warden there is pretty active. Um, but th 21 of 32 local authorities issued no DCNs for livestock worrying. Um, and I know some of these will be city areas, but it certainly can't be true for all of them. Um, I'd also comment that there does seem to be a bit of a disconnect between the police and the local dog wardens. Um, we've had some cases where we've been awa made aware of livestock worrying. Um, we approached the local dog warden and they've said, well, we know the police are involved, so we're not touching it. Um, and I, I don't really understand why that's the case. I mean, my colleague over there may know more than me. Um, I would echo the comments about the database, and it's something that we picked up on in our submission. Certainly what we've seen is that the people that allow their dogs to worry livestock um, are quite often people who don't necessarily have a fixed abode, for example. Um, and we have one recently where it was actually in Argyll when it was a really horrific livestock worrying case. The guy was actually living in a forest with, I think, about 10 huskies. Um, quite an extreme case, but he was very difficult to trace um, and subsequently moved um, and there was there was no way of tracing him and you know having that continuity there and um, so I know that was definitely a frustration at the time I think the point that was made earlier on about and I don't know enough about microchipping technology but the concept of attaching any sort of DCN to a microchip information is potentially something that could be quite useful because then it's going to follow a dog through its life I'm assuming I'm not an expert on these things um, <clears throat> also comment just on the sanctions um, so the maximum sanction for this, for a breach of a DCN, is £1,000. And I know the lady that was sat in my seat previously said, you know, they should be much higher. But what we are seeing is the people that allow their dogs to worry livestock don't have any money to pay these fines anyway. And this act seems to just have the provision for a, a fine. It doesn't have community payback orders or similar. So I think that sanctions applied have to reflect that sort of, that sort of social issue so that it's not possible for people to wriggle out. I mean, these guys don't care if they have the dog removed. They'll just go and get another one because it's so easy. So I think we have to bear that in mind when we're talking about sanctions. I do think that heftier sanctions send a clear message, but we have to make sure that we have other sanctions in place as well. Gemma, we heard uh, a lot in the first panel about the discussion about deed and breed. Do you have any evidence of all the attacks? I mean, 67% increase. Is that over the last year? That's, of attacks that's the last two years, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. a huge increase. Yeah. So I suppose two questions. One, what's the explanation for that? And two... Are there any are there any specific breeds that are doing this, or is it just all dogs? Um, no, I think in terms of explanation, I think part of the reason for such big increase has probably been, well, we'll take some credit for it here, us really encouraging people to report. Because we did a survey recently, and about 50% of our members said, if we encounter livestock quarrying, we actually won't bother reporting it. Um, I mean, some of them feel that if they do, the police won't bother to attend, all this kind of stuff. Although I have to say that that's only some of our members. Um, so I think that's probably part of the reason for the increase is the increased reporting. Um, but I do think, I mean, there's lots of moves afoot to encourage the public to take outdoor access. It links into Scottish Government's um, health targets, reducing obesity, all that kind of stuff. So there is, a, a, I can't remember the figure, but a vast proportion of visits to the outdoor, people do have dogs with them. So I think there is an increase in the public taking access to the outdoors with dogs. So that's probably part of it as well. Um, in terms of specific breeds, don't have any evidence to suggest it is specific breeds. Um, what we have definitely found, though, is that it's a behavioural thing. I mean, I know Melissa alluded to dog behaviour. Um, what we have found is once a dog has worried livestock once, it is more than likely to go back and do the same thing again. 
because it basically gets a taste for it. But I certainly can't say it's one breed over another because our members will encounter issues with, um, well, huskies, akitas, those kind of breeds, but equally terriers come up really often, really small dogs. Thank you very much. Alison Robertson. I, I was going to say that in respect of serving a dog control notice for the worry in a livestock, we would do it if we were requested by the police as long as the owner is being reported to the court for it because it is obviously it is something that they've been irresponsible and they should be going to court for it. We, I think Aberdeenshire and your figures hadn't issued any last year, but we have in the past and it would always be to that. But I'd also be interested to know, Gemma, do you have any figures on whether how many of your increased incidents are with multiple dogs? No, we don't have no, that split. No. That, um, we, we're seeing from with, on the dog-on-dog -dog attacks that have a, a, a big number of the dogs that we're dealing with there are from multiple dog households. There seems to be a link there as well. That the, There's been a shift <laughs> in dogs in society and how they're perceived within the family. And, um, you know, they get, they get one to keep the other one company and then the, their lack of control is sort of increased because the dogs become an item themselves. I'm not going to say a pack because that's not what I mean, but they, they look to each other and they tend to run off together and things. And I just wondered, because I, I know we have dealt with more in Aberdeenshire and it's mainly been multiple dog households. Can I respond to that? Briefly. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, so I would say anecdotally, our members are saying that it usually is multiple dogs that are suffering attacks from, but I don't have any actual figures for that. Okay. Melissa Donald follow up on what Gemma says it's the big dogs do the big damage which makes the big headlines but you've got to remember that the small dogs can go in they can think they're going after a rabbit they then have deaf ears they don't they they don't come back to recall they can then chase around the sheep and chase around the sheep and they won't come in and you actually won't see the damage till much later when these sheep are bought and you know their lambs and that doesn't make headlines and that is why we really are on the deed not breed you know the big dogs make their big headlines the little dogs do quite a lot of damage too dave joyce coming on on the um, bsl i think it'd be important that we make our position clear the communication workers union on breed specific legislation we do not support breed specific legislation in the communication workers union Although postal workers make up the majority of uh, dog attack victims across the UK, we believe that the BSL debate is a diversion. It takes us away from the real causes and the real problems that we actually face. Um, you know, we are pro-dog and we are anti-bad dog owner. And um, postal workers are attacked by every breed and sundry and crossbreed, you know, it doesn't matter what the breed is, you know, we, we, it, and it is a fact that we do need to uh, concentrate on the deed and not, not, not the breed, um, because the longer that debate goes on, the longer we actually are, are diverted away from the real problems that we've actually got out there, which is a huge problem of bad, irresponsible dog ownership and lack of control on that specific issue. The problem is firmly on the other end of the lead, if a lead is there. You know, you could have a Tyrannosaurus Rex as a pet if you wanted. As long as you kept it in your house, you kept it under control, you kept it secured, it's not going to attack anybody, and it's not going to attack the postman or the postwoman. But if you're totally irresponsible, you don't control it, you don't look after its welfare, you don't treat it right, you don't socialise it, then it's not going to be a surprise if it ta every opportunity it gets, it attacks the postman or the postwoman. And that's, what we, and that's our, 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 our firm belief, and I just wanted to get that out of the way. Thank you very much, Dave. I want to open to members to, to ask questions. Bill Bowman, I believe. Thank you, um, yeah. Camilla. Just a couple of questions, then to start with Mike. Um, do you see that members of the public, when there's, there is an incident, um, who own particular types of breed, are passing them to you for, for rehoming because they don't want to necessarily own them or can't control them? It's one of the problems we do have, and it tends to happen if a bull terrier breed has been involved. We normally see a spiky bull terriers getting abandoned or just uh, people deciding they don't want them because they don't want the, the devil dog tag. So so that does happen. Um, a lot of it is, as I've said down uh, before, down to <coughs> lack of enforcement, but it's, it's, it's money. When it goes away from control of dogs and skips the dangerous dogs, uh, we're looking after a number of dogs for the... Uh, police Scotland at the moment, but that's keeping them in kennels for a year until it gets to court is very bad for animal welfare, but that's costing the police budget £5,000 a year per dog. It's all down to finances, uh, and the police will do anything to say it's not a dangerous dog issue, it's a control of dogs order, um, and really 
further um, enforcement of this act would actually help because it got away from dangerous dogs is only in a public place. A lot of these incidents happen in people's homes where it's the grannies looking after the pit bull for something and the granddaughter gets killed. Um, gets away from that. If you look at the enforcement, back to Mr Joyce's point, the amount of his members that have been attacked in Scotland and how many of them have actually led to a, control, uh, a dog control notice. I mean, because a lot of them are just aren't reported because they don't know where to report, they try and report, and they get diverted to somewhere else, and then nothing happens. Sorry, Mr Bowman. <laughs> just also to ask, we've heard about um, keeping dogs on leads. Would muzzling in public, would that take away a lot of the Well, the under issue? the under the Dangerous Dogs Act, if you've got a legal pit bull terrier that's on the exempted list, it must be on a lead at all times and muzzled any time in a public place, always. In a public place, not within the house. But if it was applied to all dogs? <coughs> it, that can be a welfare issue with some dogs. Some dogs just can't take them and it can actually change their temperament and because you're taking away their one defence mechanism. It's another tool that you could use, but Alison, Melissa... Anybody that knows dogs and knows dogs owners, I'll tell you, that person can't control their dog. Your maximum penalty under this is £1,000. There is no provision, if you are convicted under this, that the sheriff can ban you for life. That's it. You'll never have another dog. If you can't have a dog, you can't have an aggressive dog. Um, I would go even further. We have we dealt with people with Police Scotland and ourselves. There are people that use dogs as weapons. Now, I was really surprised at Liam's question that the doctor sitting there, if he treats a stab wound, he's legally obliged to report it. What's the difference with a kid getting ripped up with a dog? Uh, report it. They're no reporting, they're no breaking that person's confidentiality because they're saying, here is a crime, and it's up to the police if they can investigate it. But there will be dogs that have attacked and are left alone and they'll just attack again because the owners will not take the responsibility. Colin Beattie. Uh, just following on on dog control notices, the feedback I've heard, heard from people in my constituency that have experienced these is that a dog control notice is issued, but the neighbours are not allowed to know what the terms of that are. Now, how can, how can anyone sort of police that if nobody actually knows what the terms are? So you never know if the dog's breached that notice. Alison Robertson. Yeah, well, that was... That's the reason that the confidentiality is, is in place is because we were advised by the Scottish Government um, when it was when it was brought in, because the Control of Dog Scotland Act is a civil act and the civil the dog control notices are civil, then data protection prevents us from saying that there is a notice in place because there hasn't been any criminal conviction first. What we do to because we can't sort of say, right, okay, we've put a notice in this dog, must be muzzled, so on lead. We always say to the people, we have put everything that we can in place, Google the Act, and if you see anything to give you any concern at all, give us a phone and if we'll then, if it, you're saying we saw the dog out without a muzzle, we'll then go and deal with that and get a statement because whenever they have breached the notice and we're given evidence to that, then it becomes criminal and we can tell everybody the notice is there because it's been reported to the court as a crime then. Seem very efficient. It's, no, it doesn't. And it is, it is one of the reasons that we are banging our heads against the right wall with it um, because we can't, we can't say to the neighbours... Now, if you see that dog out without lead, you see that dog without a muzzle, phone us immediately, then we can go around and um, witness it, and then they can be reported for it. Is it actual written guidance from the Scottish Government? It's not in the legislation itself. It's not in the legislation itself, but it was... Um, when it was coming in, we asked the question, and it was put to the legal department here, and that was the answer that came back. I know that was raised. We did three community sessions on this, uh, one in Airdrie, one in Dalkeith and one in Dundee. And certainly the one that Bill Bowman and I attended in Dundee, this was a real frustration for people. And it was mainly owners there that had had their dogs were attacked by other dogs. And once it had all been reported, the dog control, the dog warden wasn't able to tell. It's a frustration for us as well because it quite often results in complaints about us not doing our job, whatever, and we are not able to defend ourselves and say, well, but we have done everything that we can. So, Alison Robertson, would you, um, uh, uh, from what you've said, would I presume that you would be looking for that to be removed? Yes. To be removed, or for that certainly something that this committee would look into in yes, the course please. of its scrutiny? Yes. Okay. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Uh, two questions. Uh, the second, I'll 
point to Dave Joyce, but it, just first of all, the deed not breed piece. Uh, I completely understand what you're saying about this, I, um, Melissa Donald. Um, and the, the, the question I have, do you have any sympathy for the view that some dogs are simply not suitable uh, to be pets? And without perhaps some kind of special reason for having a particular breed or a special dispensation, the average person should not be having a certain dog which has a predisposition to violent behaviour? All dogs can be violent, full stop. Whether it be a Yorkie Terrier, or whether it be an Akita, or a Great Dane, I have been nibbled at by several different shapes and sized dogs. The difference is small dogs you can f physically pick up if you can get near enough the scruff. So no, uh, no, no deed every single time. But Mike Flynn, if I could pose the same question to you, because whilst I accept Melissa's point, if I get nibbled at by a Jack Russell, then I'm more likely to be able to do something about it than if it was a Rottweiler that's attacking me. You're obviously, you've got your more powerful breeds, but I think I said to Melissa earlier on, one of the worst injuries I've seen was a Yorkshire Terrier on a six-month-old baby's face. Discovered, and just figured for life. Um, and the traumatic effect that has when everything else. As I tried to say at the beginning, if you added Rottweilers to that list, we've got people because pit bulls are banned. You should honestly see some of the breeds that are coming in. Um, go to your kennels at Bodwell and I can show you breeds that you didn't even know exist in this country. So you've got the pit bull terrier type banned unless it's unexempted. And then when they introduced it, the, the toes are the Philly Brazil area and the, the other one, none of them were in the country. They didn't exist in this country. There was one Toza in, in the, the existence of that life. Pit bulls were targeted because they were involved in dogfighting and there was a couple of horrendous um, attacks down in uh, England. It's a knee-jerk reaction. You could add half the breeds that are in the country onto that list because they're powerful doesn't matter if it's powerful, if it's in the right hands with a knowledgeable owner. The problem you get is, one of the big problems was uh, years ago was Dalmatians. 101 Dalmatians, get one, they look lovely. They don't realise they're carriage dogs. You need to run them about 30, 40 miles a day just to keep them calm. Uh, but they get them and they try and lock up in the house and they become aggressive. A Rottweiler, properly breared, <coughs> reared, trained and looked after, is no more dangerous to the public than a Labrador. And actually, I think if you look at the national figures, there's more bites by Labradors than any other breed, just because they're so plentiful. And a lot of that happens within the household. Um, but they're not the serious ones that will, will happen and hit the front page of the papers. Melissa Donald, yeah, just uh, respond to that. I, uh, I have personally been bitten by more black Labradors than any other dog. But in today's world, where every dog is a crossbreed now, a designer crossbreed, where do you put a limit, you know? Interesting, what thank you. you sorry, Liam, what mm -hmm. would you say to Veronica Lynch's evidence that the the dog that killed her daughter as a rottweiler, the dogs, um, that dogs like that have the physical capacity to kill a child or severely maim a child, whereas a smaller dog of a different breed doesn't? I've known Mrs Lynch for 29 years. Uh, I've been in this job 32 years and I was about when that happened, not there, but at the time. The gentleman owned the dogs, to me, was criminal. You're letting 20 stone combined weight of two Rottweilers out with a five stone child. It was just a recipe for that. And it's not as if it was a lifelong friend and they'd, she had known the dogs since they came up. They were down there on a holiday. That was just stupidity. You, you just Anyone with common sense would not allow that to, to happen. So another Another question then, Mike, you're talking about responsible owners. How do we, how do we legislate for that? Sadly, you've got to wait until after the event, but then it comes on to the fact if you have been found guilty of something like that, you should never be in charge, be allowed to touch a dog again in your life. Because we do get people that have had dangerous dogs and they're dealt with by the court, and then they just go out and get another one. Is that good enough for public safety, that you've got to wait till after? Should there not be more rigorous licensing scheme that judges people fit and proper person to own such an animal? Which would be great in the ideal world. We scrapped the dog licence scheme hundreds of years ago through the post office. Um, but where do you stop? You go to responsible ownership. I think the lady said her sister wanted a cat. They were inspected. They were told, no, you're not suitable. 
for any powerful breed of dog that you want from us, you're examined in our centre, you're quizzed, your families to come up, we visit your home, we do all this kind of stuff, make sure you've got all the proper stuff. And one of the biggest complaints we get as a society is you refuse to... You're a charity, you want ready dogs, but you refuse to home me something. We will not home something to somebody that's not suitable. But I refuse somebody, they can go on the internet and get one delivered tomorrow. Would you support the reintroduction of a dog licensing scheme? There's been a call for a competency test that you know what you're actually doing. I mean, we quiz people, do you know the breed that you're taking on? Do you know the requirements of that breed? I mean, the, the one that was always hardest to rehome was um, retired greyhounds. Answer, Mike Flynn, would you oh, yeah. support the reintroduction of a dog licensing scheme? I think, given that we can't even fund the work that's being done, you and or the database that could have been set up idea? here, I don't think you could. Aff I don't think the government could afford it. But do you think it's a good idea? Yes. To reintroduce it. To reintroduce a competency test that, or something that could be removed. <coughs> if your if your license is taken off the, you surrender your dog. Melissa Donald, Alec Neal, then Alison Robertson. I think that it shouldn't just be as straightforward as going to a post office and paying 37.5p. Mm. It should be something like the driving theory driving licence where you've got hazard awareness tests, things like that. that you can, you, so if you're going to a park, you can see where the potential hazards are, showing you understand what's involved. So it's all about education involved with it having to have compulsory insurance, etc., etc. I'll bring in Alison Robertson on this point and then to Mr Neil. I, then was more, I was going to say what Melissa was saying and it really should be compulsory for people to do more research before they get a dog and prove that they've done it. Because a lot of people buy these breeds on how they look. They don't look into what their background is. All these different breeds have been honed to do certain jobs over you know, hundreds if not thousands of years by man. So they have got different traits and tendencies. And... If that trait and tendency suits your lifestyle, then that's great. Get it if you're able to train it and, and deal with it. But they go and get these big dogs and they expect them to sit in a flat 9 to 5 or better, give them out to a dog walker who walks them in a pack and then they become dog oriented. There really should be some kind of competency, t competency test rather than just... If, if, if you would just make it a fee that people pay to get a dog, then the responsible owners will do it and you know there'll be there'll be penalties there for a wee pensioner as a wee dog to keep them company, and the the, the ones that aren't law abiding just now won't do it, and they'll just not chip their dogs, so we'll never trace it to them. Alec Neil. I very much endorse what uh, Alison and Melissa and Mike are, are saying. Um, one one of the things the uh, plastic surgeon who was here earlier said to me privately on the way out is that if you look at the statistics in the National Health Service, um, the amount of resource employed by the National Health Service in dealing with the impact of dog attacks is 10 times what it is in dealing with the implications of misuse of shotguns. Uh, and yet, to own a shotgun, you require a licence. You are kept you have to keep it in a very safe place, you have to meet other conditions, and there is regular police inspection as to whether you are adhering to that system. So, uh, can I just come back to Mike's point, however, is uh, he agrees in principle, I think, with introducing such a system that's not just paying money and then owning the dog, but some kind of competency test, which would cover a whole range of things, a la very similar to having to own a shotgun. But if the licence fee, we could maybe, you know, in, in, in an ideal world, use the revenue from the licence fee and ring fence it for enforcement of the law. So you can actually solve maybe the funding issue if you had a, a proper licence fee based on competency in terms of awarding it, but then ring fence that money either through the councils or through the police or whatever, um, for enforcement of the law. So you've then got a double benefit of the benefits of a licensing system uh, along with producing the revenue, or at least a good chunk of the revenue, to enforce the law. Would that, would that be the kind of thing that would get support around the table? Mike Flynn. Make perfect sense. Um, it should be self-funded. You need a license in Sweden to get a dog before you've got the dog. You don't get the dog and then apply. Um, and there is some form of competency attached to that. Um, but if we cannot fund properly 
the enforcers to look after and I mean in the local authorities as opposed to the police then it won't happen so if it was funded through a license scheme <coughs> and if you had to pay £500 for your original license pe we've got people paying £3,500 for a pup not to us but to, to breeders it's not as if the money is the big stop gap um, yes, but it would be licence per dog, not licence per person. Yes. Yeah. Does anyone else want to respond to Alec Neil's point? Dave Joyce. Yeah. Just wanted to cover a couple of quick points that have been debated here. Firstly, on the issue of muzzling. I mean, dogs can be muzzled via a, a, a control order or an ancillary order added down by, by the courts, of course. However, I would rather see ownership and keepership banned and the courts using that option um, or over than um, uh, looking at the muzzling as a solution, because it's not a solution, in my view. Um, on BSL, well, one of the results of BSL has been that certain people have gone searching for alternatives. So by adding to the ban list, they just search for alternative animals. And so we see a lot of um, breeds such as uh, 15 stone gold dogs and Asian mastiffs turning up in the United Kingdom now. These are used for legal fighting on the Asian subcontinent. We've seen Australian cattle dogs. We've seen Russian bear dogs appearing in the United Kingdom. And that's a worry because they can get them. And, uh, you know, you can add and you can add and you can add to that list, but you'll never get to the bottom of it. And then you've got crossbreeds and then you've got the determination of whether it's an illegal animal or not. And we are going down the wrong road. We're not dealing with the problem. 81% of the attacks on our members, on postal workers, occur between the garden gate and the front door. And um, we need to deal with that issue. We need to tackle that specific problem. When that door opens and that dog comes out, it doesn't matter what breed it is, it's going to actually do some damage if it's determined to do so and the owner hasn't got it under control. And that really is the problem for us. Liam Kerr wants to ask you a specific question on that just point. On exactly this point, Dave, if I, if I might, and just give you the opportunity to say, because what we're interested in is really the solutions. Now, I was out with one of your members, with one of the posties in Aberdeen, who had been attacked in exactly the, the, the way that you're describing. So the dog's at the top of the stair. Everyone knew, according to your colleagues, uh, everyone knew that this dog was going to go off and eventually... The door was opened and there was the opportunity your member gets attacked. Now, the, the, the challenge and where the solution I'm looking for is what do you do about it? Because perhaps because of the one free bite rule, I, I'm guessing, but that dog is still there. Uh, and so your members cannot go into the stair because quite rightly... Uh, the, the Royal Mail is, is protecting them. But you have a universal service obligation. You have to go in and deliver Correct. the mail to the rest mm -hmm. of the doors in the stair. So th there's, what I recall was there's this tension between what needs to happen and what actually is happening and the dog owners in there and the people need their mail. So what's the solution? Uh, what can this committee be doing to make sure that that situation isn't presenting itself? There are a number of things that we can do. And first and foremost, as I say, we've got to clamp down on, 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 on bad dog ownership because at the moment, any criminal... Um, can buy any dog at any time and buy as many as they want and just completely ignore their welfare and not keep them under control. Scheme that we've yeah. heard here. Yeah. You would, um, you would I mean, on licensing, uh, we used to be completely neutral on that mm -hmm. um, and we watched for many years the debate between Dogs Trust and the RSPCA, one large organisation in favour and one opposed. But over the years, we've now actually come to be in favour of the reintroduction of the dog licence. We've looked very closely, because as you know, we work with all the governments in the United Kingdom, and we work with the Northern Ireland government. We've looked at the licensing regime that they've got there. And of course, it does actually offer the opportunity. Um, in Scotland, for example, we estimate it would raise around eight to ten million pounds if we actually introduced a dog licence uh, around about ten to twelve pounds, which could be ring-fenced, as Alex suggested, and used specifically to actually put some resources back into dog control um, at this time when funding and resources are very short and cuts are being made left, right and centre and fewer people are being expected to do more and do miracles in some cases, which is impossible. Um, so we believe that that is actually um, a, a, a good idea to actually do that and we would actually support that. In fact, we'd support anything that would actually improve dog control at the moment because 3,000 of our people get noshed up by dogs every year, badly injured and, uh, you know, uh, and are not able to actually continue in their job. And we continue to actually face this massive problem that is not getting any better. It's getting worse and worse. And we really do need the police to do their job properly, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal to start doing their job properly, 
We need criminals to be actually held to account for the crimes that they commit. These are serious, aggravated offences, sectionary offences under the Dangerous Dogs Act, and these people are walking away scot-free. That's got to end. Thank you very much, Dave Joyce. I'm going to close very soon, but give final word to Alison Robertson. Just quickly, the, the scenario that, you, that Mr Joyce described there about a dog at the top of the stairs and, and not being, um, causing fear and alarm, the, the Control of Dogs Scotland Act was um, is quite clear that the dog doesn't actually have to have had a bite. It has to have been... The, the, the officer has to be satisfied that the dog has been out of control and, and, and has caused fear and alarm, and that fear and alarm was reasonable in the circumstances. So if this dog had, you know, was known to be a problem and it was there and it was out of control, then a dog control notice could be served in those circumstances on the owner. So it doesn't have to have had a bite for the control of dogs to, to work. But um, my experience with the post office is... An, they're busy, as are we, and I know they have their own protocols, and they, they go and speak to the owners of dogs where there's a problem with the postal workers, but we don't actually hear of any incidents involving post until there has been a bite. And maybe maybe there, there has to be improved reporting there and a better two-way street there that they say, I'm a bit worried about that dog that they've got at number six, it's blah, blah, and we could just go and educate the owner before it gets to the point where somebody's been bitten. OK, thank you, Alison. Willie Coffey. Thanks to you. I mean, it's very moving hearing some of this evidence here and the passion that has been uh, given to us. Uh, I, I've had some experience as well, Dave, of uh, accompanying the postmen and women and, and these journeys. And you said 81% of your members are attacked between the gate and the front door. Despite all the legislation and licensing and interventions and training and, and so on, so what is actually going to stop that, do you think, Dave? from a post man or woman entering the gate and getting to the door and stop them being attacked? Is it down to ownership, training the owners to be responsible? Is it locking dogs up before the postman arrives? How do we stop it? Well, we've mounted um, huge campaigns ourselves. That's jointly ourselves and Royal Mail. We work very closely on this. And um, of course, we, every year we have our Dog Awareness Week, which occurs in July. We've actually distributed millions of postcards, posters, um, through our customer service points, we actually um, campaign to raise awareness um, of uh, responsible dog ownership ourselves. And that's had some success because we peaked at 6,500 dog attacks on postal workers in 2007, 2008. And through our own efforts alone, we've reduced that now by 50%. So, but we seem to have plateaued now at 3,000 um, 3, attacks a year. Mr Coffey is asking you specifically what would prevent, you talked about the attack between the door and the gate, what are you called, what, are the, what do the communications workers union well, want that would prevent we need to that? Do, one of the things we need to do, as I say, we need to actually reframe the way in which we actually apply and enforce the law for a start off, we've got to get rid of the one free bike rule, we've got to get rid of that. We've got to raise public awareness. In the debate that actually took place on the 8th of May, Christine Graham made the point, and it was well made. The public knows more about the smoking ban than they do about the dangerous dogs legislation. Public awareness of what? Awareness of dog control laws and what's expected of them as responsible owners, what the law says. And what we also need to make sure, because there is a huge range of uh, penalties available to the courts when people come before the courts, but if you look at the, 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 if you like, the level of penalties that are handed down, um, it, it's so inconsistent for a start off, and very, very rarely do we see actually substantial penalties handed down. I'll give you an example. We had two very similar attacks where two postwomen had fingers bitten off when they were actually pushing letters through the letterbox. And um, they were very similar injuries, very similar circumstances, and one court handed down a £9,000 penalty, and another court in another part of the country handed down a, a penalty of £100. Now, that's not good enough. We've got to do something about that as well. These people have got to realise if they're a bad owner, then they're going to face the consequences when they come to court. Public awareness of what the legislation says, the requirement to actually be a good dog owner. And I agree entirely that if we were able to introduce a licensing regime that actually ensured competency of some level... You see, most of these people shouldn't be dog owners at all. Anybody can become a dog owner. You can go out and buy as many dogs as you want. There are no limitations on what you do, the breed, the type anything no nothing to stop them you know and the one free bite rule i mean i just want to end on this could you imagine applying that to the offenses of murder or drunk driving or driving you know d d causing death by a dangerous drive? it's ludicrous it's absolutely ludicrous and yet that is going on today i've got endless number of cases here where 
there's been uh, cases that have not, not been prosecuted. There have been cases that have been found guilty. There have been cases that have succeeded at appeal on the basis of the courts accepting because it was the first ever offence or display of aggression by the animal, then there is no offence at all and it's been actually thrown out of court. Thank you. Those people are shielded by Thank the you. inadequacies of the law. Great. Thank you very much. And ask Sarwar. I share Dave's uh, passion on this. I want to just pick up on Mike <coughs> Flynn's comment about, uh, I think, his real-world answer around yes in principle to licences, but actually if we don't back up the resources, then it's going to fail. So, uh, I mean, a lot of what we've discussed this morning is around how we strengthen the legislation, how we get um, individual uh, responsibility uh, and what punishments happen. But in the absence of actually having a budget line and backing up with resources, whether that be from central government, from for local government, or indeed the institutions that I've got to deliver, um, we're, we're, we're always going to continue to fail. And I think there needs to be a serious discussion about the money. Where's the money going to come from? How do we fund this? And how do we deliver it? Because in the absence of that, we can have all the best intentions of the world. We're still going to fail. Where's the money going to come from? Yeah, I think uh, Mr Neil made a good suggestion about the licence fee. And there's, I think... Mike Flynn also said there seems to be no shortage of money to buy uh, dogs. So to apportion a bit of that expenditure onto regulation and control. Sorry, Mr. Neil. But you don't pee VAT when they're buying a dog. No, the indeed. VAT free is a dog VAT free. Um, depends on if you buy it from a reputable breeder. But HMRC is recovering, recovering coffee funds from illegal breeders who are not paying tax without VAT or whatever quite a few high profile cases on that one. Okay. We need to close reasonably soon. Do any members have any further questions? Do any witnesses have anything they would like to add briefly? Okay. Can I thank you all very much indeed for coming this morning and for your evidence. I now close the public session of this meeting. Thank you.